Okay. Well, good morning. We're going to look at a number of reformers. Um, Pastor Noel is going to be doing dealing with Luther later and other matters. I've got uh, under my my number is other reformers. Uh, and so we're going to start with Heinrich Bullinger. You may never have heard of him, but he was, uh, I, I've called him the forgotten reformer. Uh, can we get a full picture up there, please? Full picture, not just that little thing in the middle. You can, uh, that's better. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Now, Bullinger, as I said, is often known as a forgotten reformer. Uh, he was Swiss and he was German speaking. He took over really from Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli, who was the same time as Luther, but wasn't really, uh, uh, in, as I should say, influenced much by Luther. It was a separate uh, reformation that started in uh, eastern Germany, eastern Switzerland, I should say, the German-speaking part. And it mainly was over the fact that the Pope was employing Swiss to fight his wars. The Swiss provided armies for the Pope, and the Pope was fighting various, uh, various people who were against him down in Italy and other places, and, he, and many of the Swiss men were dying in battle. And Zwingli was very affected by this, uh, and sort of began to speak out against it, and started the Reformation in, in eastern Switzerland. Uh, this was just about really even before, but slightly the time of Luther, but that was about what was happening and he started a reformation, but he, were, he was killed in a battle against some of the Roman Catholic cantons of eastern uh, it was Switzerland. And then Heinrich Bullinger uh, came along. Uh, he was there, he'd been a priest. He was actually the son of a priest. Yeah, priests in those days had lots of children, that was quite common. Um, but he there, and that's all I'll read some of my, my notes here. The year was 2004, uh, marked the 500 years anniversary of the birth of one of the great reformers of the 16th century, and this is Bullinger, Heinrich Bullinger. It largely went unnoticed by many in the reformed community. However, the one who studies the Reformation will come across his name, but so often very little is said about him. He is generally known as a successor of Ulrich Zwingli, Zwingli, leader of the Swiss Reformation in Zurich, but largely Bullinger is forgotten and often ignored. And that was, not, that was not true in his day. He was a friend of Calvin, and Calvin actually made six trips, uh, uh, um, mostly probably by horseback or walking, uh, from Geneva right over to Zurich to visit uh, Bullinger and consult with him. One looks through the index of articles in various magazines, <coughs> the papers given at, at various conferences, you find that very little is ever said about Bullinger. He was born in July the 18th, 1504. That made him 21 years younger than Luther and 20 years of the junior of Zwingli, the Swiss reformer. Although he was five years older than Calvin, he outlived the great Genevan reformer by 11 years. He was only 27 years of old age when he took the place of Zwingli as the chief pastor in Zurich. He was born in Bremgarten in the Swiss canton of Argo the youngest of five sons, of, and they were all sons of the local priest. Many priests at that time had a concubine who was in fact their wife in all but name. The people of the day were used to this, and if the man was faithful to the woman and lived as married, uh, it was tolerated and not looked upon as immoral as most, by most of the population. However, the bishop would collect a regular syntax uh, from such a relationship, and Bullinger was educated in the School of the Brethren of the Common Life at Emmerich and then to the University of Cologne. Now he studied scholastic and patristic theology while at Cologne. At his, at, as was common in those days, he studied the classic books of theology. Peter Lombard, Sentences, not that helpful to bring a man to truth, faith in Christ, yet Lombard led him to turn to the early church fathers. He read Chrysostom, Ambrose, Oregon, and Augustine. And he soon discovered that there was a difference between the fathers and the schoolmen of the Middle Ages, that were the Roman Catholic men of the Middle Ages. However, the writings of Luther had begun to cause much debate, and so he too soon began to read Luther and Melanchthon, 
when you in turn then led him to the study of the Bible. And I want to stop here at this moment because there are two very important matters and things that happened under the will of God. First of all, the printing press was invented. It had only been in, been in use not very many years uh, at this time. But the, now it was possible to have books printed. And the Bible was printed. You think up until almost this time, all the Bibles were handwritten. If I asked you to go away and write that, and copy out your Bible by hand, how long would it take you? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Well, that was it. But now because of the printing press being invented under God, it was now the Gutenberg Bible was the first printing in Europe. Uh, and now the Bible was being printed and everybody could have a Bible for the first time. It cost money, of course, but if you could afford it, you could have your own Bible and read it. And it was being translated, of course, uh, from Latin into German and everything. So here it was, the Bible. The second matter that was very, very important was that the Muslims had taken Constantinople. Now, Constantinople is the old name for Istanbul. If you look on a map, it's just across the Bosphorus. And they took that big city, and many of the leaders of the city and the uh, many men from the churches and everything fled north. And they brought with them copies of the New Testament in Greek. And they'd never been Greek, really been used in, in Europe. But now Greek became known by the time we come to this time of the Reformation. And Greek was now being studied because Greek copies of the Bible were now available. The, and the Greek texts of the New Testament were available. And they were able to compare it with the Latin Vulgate and found some of the mistakes that were there in the Latin Vulgate. And they had the Greek Testament. And people were studying Greek in Europe for the first time. So that was very, very important, those changes. So what happened with Bullinger? He purchased a New Testament and began to read it. If the study of the scriptures then became, began to take precedence over everything else, and somebody has said this, from his own testimony, he seems to be one of the few men who were directly taught by God through private study of the Bible, and with little other help, with characteristic, quiet passion, he devoted himself to the study of the Bible night and day during the year 1521 to 1522. And the end was the simple penetrating and final statement, I learned, said he, that salvation came from God through Christ alone. It was while he was there at Cologne that he came to true faith and in Christ as his saviour. Um, he'd returned to the Swiss Confederation and taught a school in the Cistercian convent at Kappel, which is quite close to Zurich. I had the privilege of visiting Kappel on one occasion as I visited Zurich. I actually stood in Bullinger's pulpit for a while. Then he re reformed the convent in agreement with the abbot, and Wolfgang Jonah was the name of that particular person. And during that time, he became acquainted with Zwingli, the eloquent and fiery reformer, and attended the conference with the Anabaptists at Zurich in 1525, as well as the important deputation at Bern in 1528. Bern is over it much more in the western side of Switzerland. He then got married. He married Anna Aldrichweiler, a former nun in 1529, who proved to be an excellent wife and helpmeet. Uh, he then accepted a call to Bremgarten as successor of his father, uh, who had confessed the doctrines of the Reformation just before his death. Following the death of Zwingli in battle at Kappel in 1531, the city council of Zurich called him to the, be the preacher in the Grossmeister, which is the big, great, big, large church in the center of Zurich. The city had been humiliated by the defeat and wanted no more fiery preachers to disturb the peace. They therefore chose Bullinger to become the Antistes, or chief pastor of Zurich. They saw him as someone more moderate than Zwingli. Uh, however, when he preached his first sermon, the congregation thought that Zwingli had risen from the dead. Yet he indeed proved to be more circumspect than Zwingli and remained the preacher there for 44 years. In his early years in Zurich, from 1531 to 1538, he would often preach daily and sometimes twice a day. 
This was alongside his work as a pastor. And not only to his people, but the many who began to seek his advice from all over Europe. This was all together, together with his ordinary duties of being a husband and father to his growing family. He was an educator and a leader of the clergy, concerned for their pastoral welfare as well as that of the laity. He was deeply concerned with the cultivation of piety and godly living, which could only take root in an ordered society. During, dur during the Marian persecution in England, that was when queen, uh, the, the Queen was now Mary, she's often referred to in our, in our church history now as, as Bloody Mary, uh, that's because she executed many, many Protestants. She would reign from 1553 to 1558. He received many exiles in Zurich, often welcoming such to his own home as people escaped from England and came across the channel. This meant he had many friends in the English church. And during the reign of Elizabeth, that's the, when Mary died, her sister, sort of half-sister, Elizabeth became Elizabeth I, and she was a Protestant. And the leaders of the Anglican church often consulted Bullinger on many matters concerning the church and doctrine. He pu his published works, not including those edited after his death and translations, number 119 volumes. How many of you have written 119 books? <laughs> However, all his works have never been published or made available in modern times. What is remarkable is that his works and writings were printed far more frequently in many different editions in the 16th century than those of Luther, Melanchthon, and Calvin combined. So this man is an important man in the time of the Reformation. Let the figures speak for themselves. In addition to his regular duties as pastor, preaching regularly, initially every day, but later less frequently, Bullinger carried through an extensive literary program. Prominent among his works are commentaries. While he was at Capel, in the convent there, he preached through almost all the books of the New Testament. His great concern was that people would know the scriptures. He was insistent on fixing the canon. Zwingli, for example, had great difficulty accepting the book of Revelation. Bullinger also wrote many polemical tr uh, treatises against the Anabaptists and Lutherans. Now, the Anabaptists are not Baptists, okay? They're different, they're Anabaptists. And people like the, uh, they're different, they will be different. They baptized adults, but by various means, uh, not by immersion. As well as doctrinal writings on the Eucharist and the Scriptures. One of his major works was the first history of the Reformation. Of well, special interest to England are the decades, and I'll get a couple of copies out and show you in a moment, of ten sermons each on tr Christian doctrine. These were prescribed by Archbishop Whitgift in 1586 to be read by all the clergy who had a poorer education. This was to meet the criticism of those Puritans who were still insisting on changing the Church of England and wanting a Presbyterian order of government. Quotation. In 1586, the reformed Archbishop of Canterbury, John Whitgift, drew up instructions for those called to the ministry, which he called orders for the better increase of learning in the inferior ministers. Junior clergymen and those wishing to be licensed as public preachers who did not have a theological education were told to procure a Bible, a copy of Bullinger's Decades, and a blank-paged exercise book. The Archbishop told the candidates they must read a chapter of the Bible every day, making notes of what they had learnt in their exercise book. Each week they should read through one of Bullinger's books and make appropriate notes of what they had learnt and then once a quarter meet with their tutor to discuss their reading and notes and receive his further instructions. More important perhaps than the academic labours were Bullinger's confessional contributions which began in 1536, while when, with Bucer and Leo Judd, he drew up the first Helvetic confession in a futile attempt to reach agreement with the Lutherans. Of a peaceful disposition, Bullinger achieved greater ecumenical success in 1549. For in that year after discussing with Calvin, the Consensus Tigurinus, or the Zurich Consensus, consisting of 26 articles on the sacraments, united Zurich 
and other German-speaking Swiss churches with G Geneva and Neuchâtel. Now, let me say this. Geneva and Neuchâtel weren't German-speaking, they're French-speaking, just like Calvin. Bullinger's crowning confessional achievement came in 1566 when, at the request of the Elector Palatine, he issued a statement of beliefs <coughs> which commonly known as the Second Helvetic Confession, found wide acceptance. It consists of lengthy theological statements of 30 articles, which he later revised. This statement became known as the Second Helvetic Confession and became the official creed of the Swiss, Swiss cantons. It was also adopted in, in Germany, Palatine, and was recognized in Scotland in 1566, Hungary in 1567, France in 1571, and Poland in 1578. Also favorably received in Holland and England, it was subsequently recognized as one of the most authoritative statements of Reformed theology. Bullinger maintained a large correspondence with people in almost all countries of Europe. Beza therefore called him the common shepherd of all Christian churches because he was consulted by so many on various practical church and doctrinal matters. The extent of Bullinger's correspondence is astonishing. He embraces letters to and from all the distinguished Protestant divines of his age, such as Calvin, Melanchthon, Bucer, Beza, Lasky, Cranmer, Hooper, Jewell, and crowned heads who consulted him, such as Henry VIII, Edward VI, Queen Elizabeth I of England, Henry II of France, King, of Christ, King Christian of Denmark, Philip of Hesse, and the Elector Frederick of the Palatinate. Calvin's correspondence extended throughout Europe, epistolary exchanges that played such a decisive role in the spread of the revival of evangelical faith comprises some 4,300 extant letters. Bullinger's correspondence, however, available in the Zurich archives, numbers 12,000 letters. Have you written 12,000 letters in your lifetime? <laughs> well, this is, this is Bullinger. We could go on quite a lot, but I've got other people to talk about. But he was a great man, a great theologian, great friend of Calvin, uh, and everything. I'll f f f finish up here. Let me say this. I'll leave this with this, a bit of doctrine. Bullinger on predestination. Let me say, all the reformers believed in predestination. All the reformers. Luther, Swingley, Calvin, all these Bullinger, they all believed in predestination. Some have maintained that Bullinger did not hold to double predestination. That was Calvin's view, yes. Formerly, he did hold to such a view. When he disagreed with Calvin, it was Calvin's inclusion of Adam's fall into sin which the divine, within the divine decree. Bullinger was always seeking to guard against any idea that God was the author of sin. Bullinger argued that God foresaw but did not administer the fall into sin. He disagreed with the explanation of the doctrine of reprobation in such a way that it seemed to make God such an author. He did, however, speak of a double decree which is the ultimate reason why some are saved and others are not. Yet he did not emphasize this. However, he argued that the loss of some is in no immediate sense owing to God's will. It is rather owing to the reprobate's rejection of the proffered divine grace. How can one know one is elect? It is that one believes. This is God's gift to the elect. On the other hand, unbelief is the occasion for the rejection of others. God does not delight in the death of any, for he desires that all might be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. B Bullinger outlived the other reformers. Martin Luther died in 1543, Melanchthon in 1560, Calvin in 1564. Bullinger wrote on July the 19th, 1564, to Theodore Beza on the death of his great friend Calvin, which had occurred on May the 27th. Calvin had visited Bullinger in Zurich, as I said, six times. And this is what Bullinger said about Calvin. I cannot express what pain I experienced when I learned that Calvin, that esteemed brother, had been taken from us. I fear that God in his anger has determined for us a horrible trial. In three or four years, Philip Melanchthon, Martin, Mar uh, Martyr, Peter Martyr, Vermigli, his intimate friend, Musculus, 
Hypericus, Calvin had been removed. All very great men through whom God has surpassed himself in granting us many and eminent gifts. In no way do I, con I contest their rest and deliverance from this hideous world. They now enjoy a heavenly purity. With all my heart I desire that the Lord Christ, if so he willed, would soon unite me with them. His final years, however, were affected by much grief. His beloved wife died of the plague in the early months of 1564. Now the plague was very common. Many people lost their wives, husbands, others, children in the plague, which ravaged Europe just sweeping through every few years. He was spared, but he never had good health after that. He lived for another 11 years and died in 1575. I'll just read a conclusion. Bullinger was a great man who has largely been forgotten. He has been eclipsed by the genius of Calvin, and although to this, in his day, his advice, counsel, and wisdom were sought on many matters by many of the churches throughout Christendom, following his death and decline of the Swiss churches, his influence has largely been forgotten. We may not agree with his views on church government and would strongly disagree with him over the matter of church discipline. His views, view was that the integration of church and state, it was primarily the responsibility of the magistrates to be responsible for church discipline. Yet he was passionately interested, however, in the preaching of the gospel to all and the calling of men to repentance and faith in Christ. He desired to remove all obstacles to that proclamation. At the same time, he sought to put the Reformed churches clearly where they belonged. They were not some new upstart sectarians, but they were the real continuation of the universal church. It was the papacy as it had emerged which was the departure from the faith and from the true church. The Reformed faith was the true continuation of the church of Jesus Christ. There are the these are themes we should seek to proclaim today and hold on to strongly in these days when so many are proclaiming another gospel and moving so far from the faith of the New Testament or the early church fathers and that of the reformers. Bullinger. We move on. We've got a little bit of time, I hope still. So. got a few more people to look at. Um, we'll look at Martin Bucer, please. Bucer, okay. And Martin Bucer, another reformer. I wonder if you could open my suitcase for me down there. Just put it down here. It's full of books. It's full of books. Open it up, just please open it up. Lay it down, lay it down, lay it down, please. Young Artie, simply. Okay. Just open it up. Take the books out. Take the books out. Take the books out. Take the books out, please. Take the books out, please. Come on. Just pile them out. Is this for no. giveaway? No. Giveaway? No. no. That's it. That's it. Now, that's it. Give me, that. Give me that one. Give me this one. This is, these are Bullinger's books, The Decades, which were distributed and every pastor in England had a copy back in the six, uh, 1600s, okay? Uh, 1500, late 1500s. So these were the two books. Uh, they were probably not like this, but they were bound together. But these were Bullinger's Decades, which are still in print today as other books of Bullinger. The Decades of Henry Bullinger. I thought you might like to see them. They are, a, they are books on doctrine, just like Calvin's Institutes. That's what they go through. But we're coming to Martin Bucer. We've got some books on Bucer, I think, somewhere. Uh, Martin Bucer was born on the 11th of November, 1491. There's a red book somewhere, Bucer. It's under that pile. Red book somewhere. Bucer, well, that, there we are. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. It was there. Don't matter. Wagner, man. Wagner, Wagner. Okay, Bucer was originally a member of the Dominican Order, okay? Most of these men were, first of all, went into the minister priests. They were born of, of either priestly families or they went in and became uh, monks and other things and uh, entered into different orders. And he would say he was a Dominican. But after be, meeting Martin Luther in 1518, he changed for his monastic vows. Uh, he arranged for them to be, a, be annulled and he began to work for the Reformation. Bucer's efforts to reform the church in Wissembourg resulted in his excommunication from the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and he had to flee and run for his life. And he went to Strasbourg. Now Strasbourg is on the Rhine, 
between France and Germany. Okay, right there. Uh, there he joined a team of reformers which included Matthew Zell, Wolfgang Capital, and Caspar Hedio. He acted as a mediator between the two leading reformers, Luther and Zwingli, and differed on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. That, well, Luther and Zwingli differed on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Later, Bucer sought the remnant to continue articles of faith such as the Tetrapolitan Confession and the Wittenberg Concord, working closely with Melanchthon on the latter. Bucer believed that the Catholics in the Holy Roman Empire could be convinced to join the Reformation. Through a series of conferences organized by Charles V, he tried to unite Protestants and Catholics to create a German national church separate from Rome. He did not achieve this, as political events led to the Schmalkaldic War and the retreat of Protestantism within the empire. In 1548, Bucer was persuaded under duress to sign the Augsburg Interim, which imposed certain forms of Catholic worship. However, he continued to promote reforms until the city of Strasbourg accepted the Interim and forced him to leave. In 1549, Bucer was exiled into to England, where under the guidance of Thomas Cranmer, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, he was able to influence the second revision of the Book of Common Prayer. He died in Cambridge, England at the age of 59. Although his ministry, although his ministry did not lead to the formation of a new denomination, many Protestant denominations have claimed him as one of their own. He is remembered as an early pioneer of ecumenism. Now I bring him up, Martin Bucer, because I'm an Englishman, okay. Now many of these men influence the Church of England. Uh, Bucer was one, we've got others as well who were, died in England. There's John Knox, which we're going to mention in a moment. Uh, he also uh, influenced the Church of England, he was Scotsman. These men influenced the Church of England. Now the Church of England uh, is well, it's, it's something like, we you know, wear vestments and things like this, but there are many evangelicals today in the Church of England. And the articles of the Church of England and the doctrines of the Church of England on paper are those which were influenced by these reformers, such as Bucer, such as Knox, and other men uh, in the, the Book of Common Prayer, which is the book of the Church of England. Martin Bucer, who was also a great help to Calvin, when Calvin went, uh, went there. Let me just read the piece about Calvin. Because he, well, I'll probably come to it when he, when, in con Calvin. Let's move over to Knox, please, can we? Because of time, Knox. Knox, where's my, where's my director for the thing we? She's disappeared. Oh, I've, I don't think I've got it here. That's, that's no, that's beautiful, that's, Sorry, sorry, go back. I'm the one doing it at the moment. Okay, wait. Akona. Akona. That's Knox, okay. Sorry, I forgot this. Okay, John Knox. He was born somewhere between 1505 and 1515. Nobody really knows when he was born. Uh, in the town of East Lothian, that's in Scotland. His father was a merchant. All that is known about his mother is that her maiden name was Sinclair and that she died when Knox was a child. Their, old, their eldest son, William, carried on his father's business, which helped Knox to, uh, to, with really much of his uh, connections with the continent of Europe. Knox was probably educated at a grammar's grammar school uh, in Haddington in Scotland. In this time, the priesthood was the only path for those who had, incl who had inclinations for academic uh, uh, studies and everything. So uh, he then became, went to the University of St. Andrews at the and, and possibly the University of Glasgow. Uh, uh, and then Knox appears to become basically a priest. Uh, a min he described himself as a minister of the sacred order in the diocese of St. Andrews, notably by apostolic authority. Uh, rather than taking up particular duties in a parish, he became tutor to two sons of Hugh Douglas of Long Niddy. He also taught the son of John Cockburn of Omiston. Both of these lairds, they were, they were rich men, they were you know, 
in the land, uh, with, with land and everything else, and embraced the new religious ideas of the Reformation. So this also now began to influence John Knox. Knox did not record when or how he was converted to the Protestant faith, but perhaps the key formative influences on Knox were Patrick Hamilton and George Wishart. Wishart was a reformer who had fled Scotland in 1538 to escape punishment for heresy. He first moved to England, where in Bristol he preached against the veneration of the Virgin Mary, forced to make a public recantation, and was, and was burned in effigy at the Church of St. Nicholas as a sign of his abjuration. He then took refugee, refuge in Germany and Switzerland, while on the continent he translated the first Helvetic Confession into English. He returned to Scotland in 1544, but the timing of his return was unfortunate. In December 1543, James Hamilton, Duke of Ch Chattelbrow, the appointed regent of the infant Mary, Queen of Scots, had decided that with the Queen Mother, Mary of Guise, and Cardinal David Beaton to persecute the Protestant sect and had taken, that had taken root in Scotland. Wishart travelled throughout Scotland preaching in favour of the Reformation, and when he arrived in East Lothian, Knox became one of his closest associates. Knox acted as his bodyguard, bearing a two-handed sword in order to defend him. You can see Knox is like he's been carrying this big sword, a two-handed sword. Okay, in December 45, 1545, Wishart was seized on Beaton's orders by the Earl of Bothwell and taken to the Count's Castle of St. Andrews. Knox was present on the night of Wishart's arrest was prepared to follow him into captivity, but Wishart persuaded him against this course, saying, Nay, return to your bairns as children, and God bless you. Bairns is Scottish word, okay? You, one is sufficient for a sacrifice. Wishart was subsequently prosecuted uh, for heresy, and on March the 1st, 1546, he was burnt at the stake in the presence of Cardinal Beaton. Knox had avoided being arrested by Lord Bothwell through Wishart's advice to return to tutoring. Uh, and he carries on uh, teaching and everything else. Uh, but one time, while he was in the castle of St. Andrews, uh, it, some took revenge for Wishart's execution. The assassins seized the castle, uh, etc. And we find this. Now, Knox became very much a, a preacher at this time uh, in Scotland. Uh, and while he was preaching in the parish church on the Protestant principle of the popular election of a pastor, he proposed Knox, this per, uh, John Ruff did, to the congregation of, of, for that office. Knox did not relish the idea. And so he then, he was preaching there in, in, in the castle and everything else. He was a great preacher uh, and preach. But his chaplaincy of the castle garrison was not long. Well, because while Hamilton was willing to negotiate with England to stop their support of the rebels and bring the castle back under his control, Mary of Guise decided that it could not be, t could be taken only by force and requested the King of France, Henry II, to intervene. And so 21 French galleys, a galley was something with oars and rowed, approached St. Andrews under the command of, of Strossi, prior of Capua. The French besieged the castle and forced the surrender of the garrison on the 31st of July, 1547. The Protestant nobles and others, including Knox, were taken prisoner and forced to row in the French galleys. And Knox spent an hour, a year and a half rowing in a galley. Now this was rows of oars, and the men were chained to these oars. They used about three men on each oar, and you rowed. And if you didn't row, you got whipped and everything else. And that's what he spent a year and a half rowing on a French galley, a ship with all these oars on both sides. So really from the whole Roman times at least these really came in, but that was it. That's, that was his life for a year and a half. Eventually he was able to get away. He was a prisoner swap, swapping and everything else uh, and that. In, he says in summer of 1548 the galleys returned to Scotland to scout for English ships. Knox's health was now at its lowest point due to the severity of his confinement. He was ill with a fever and others on the ship were afraid for his life. Even in this state, Knox recalled his mind remained sharp and he comforted his fellow prisoners with hopes of release. While the ships were lying offshore between St. Andrews and Dundee, 
The spires of the parish church where he preached appeared in view. James Balfour, a fellow prisoner, asked Knox whether he recognized the landmark. He replied that he knew it well. In February 1549, after spending a total of 19 months in the galley prison, Knox was released. It is uncertain how he obtained his liberty. Late in the year, Henry II arranged with Edward VI of England the release of all remaining uh, Castilian prisoners. On his release, Knox took refuge in England. The Reformation in England was a, was a less radical movement than the continental counterparts, but there was a definite breach with Rome. The Archbishop of Canterbury, a man called Thomas Cranmer, and the regent of King Edward VI. Now, King Edward VI at this stage was only about 12 years of age, 12 or 13. He died when he was 16, I think 16. Uh, but he was just, he was, a, he was a godly young man and his advisors were Christians. The Duke of Somerset uh, 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 were decidedly Protestant minded. However, much work remained to bring reformed ideas to the clergy and to the people. On, in April 1549, Knox was licensed to work in the Church of England. His first commission was in Berwick-upon-Tweed, which is in the north, not far from Scotland. He was obliged to use the recently released Book of Common Prayer, which maintained the structure of the Sarum Rite, which adopted, adapted the content of the doctrine of the Reformed Church of England. Knox, however, modified its use to accord with the doctrinal emphasis on the, of the continental reformers. In the pulpit, he preached Protestant doctrines with great effect as his congregation grew. There he met his, his wife, Marjorie Bowes. She actually died in 1560. Her father, Richard Bowes, died 1558. He was a descendant of the old, an old uh, aristocracy family. Elizabeth Ask was an heiress of a Yorkshire family, the Asks of Richmondshire. Elizabeth Bowes presumably met Knox when he was employed in Berwick. Several letters revealed a close friendship between them. It is not recorded when Mox, Knox married Marjorie, but Knox attempted to attain the consent of the Bowes family, but her father and her brother were opposed to the marriage. But towards the end of 1550, Knox was then appointed a preacher of St. Nicholas Church in Newcastle upon Tyne, that's in the north again. The following years, he was appointed one of the six royal chaplains serving the king. On 16th of October 1551, John, John Dudley, first Duke of Northumberland, overthrew the Duke of Somerset to become the new regent of the young king. Knox condemned the coup d'etat in a sermon, etc. Knox was asked to come to London, though, to preach before the court. And in his first sermon, he advocated a cha change for the second edition of the Book of Common Prayer. The liturgy required, required worshippers to kneel during communion, and Knox did not believe that that was correct. He considered it to be idolatry to kneel before the communion. That was one of the questions of it, it, which come up constantly during the Reformation because of those who, who this... But, so he was very influential in influencing the B Book of Common Prayer uh, while he was there in England. But what happened in, indeed, but sometime he said, I have thought that impossible, to, I, it, it may have been, so to have moved, removed my affection from the realm of Scotland, that any realm or nation could have been equal dear to me, but God take, no, take to record in my conscience that the troubles present and appearing to be in the realm of England are double more Dolores unto my heart than ever were the troubles in Scotland. Well, Mox then moved from, Scot from England and went to Frankfurt. Knox disembarked in Dieppe, France, and continued to Geneva, where John Calvin had established his authority. When Knox arrived, Calvin was in difficult position. He had recently prosecuted the execution of the scholar Michael Servetus for heresy. Now, I'll come back to that with Calvin. Knox asked Calvin four difficult political questions, whether a minor could rule or by divine right, whether a female could rule and transfer sovereignty to her husband, whether people should obey ungodly or idolatrous rulers, and what party, partly godly persons should follow if they resisted an idolatrous ruler. Calvin gave cautious replies and referred him to the Swiss reformer Heinrich Bullinger. Well, he was there uh, in, in, in with Calvin in, uh, for quite a while, 
he, he actually received an invitation from a congregation of English exiles in Frankfurt and he accepted the call with Calvin's blessing and then was in, Cal in Frankfurt. And then eventually he returned back to Geneva. Uh, uh, I've been to Geneva and the, the big church of Calvin St. Peter. Right behind it there's a small church which was the church where Knox was ministering to a group of English group, English exiles who had fled from England. Uh, after his return to Geneva, Knox was chosen to be the minister at a new place of worship, petition from, Cal petition from Calvin. In the meantime, Elizabeth Bowes wrote to Knox asking him to return to Marjorie in Scotland, which he did at the end of August. Despite initial doubts about the state of Reformation in Scotland, Knox found the country significantly changed since he was carried off in the galley in 1547. Although Mary Queen of Mary of Guise was in, in charge there, Knox began to preach again uh, in Scotland. Eventually he then returned again to Geneva uh, in 1556 to 1559. And for two years he lived a happily life in Geneva. He recommended Geneva to his friends in England as the best place of asylum for, for Protestants. In one letter he wrote this, I neither fear nor ashamed to say is the most perfect school of Christ that ever was in the earth since the days of the apostles. That's talking about Geneva. In other places I confess Christ to be truly preached, but manners and religion so sincerely reformed I have not seen in any other place. He's talking about Geneva. Knox led a busy life in Geneva. He preached three sermons a week, each lasting well over two hours. Okay, so what can you reclaim and have a pastor? Well over two hours, okay? The services used a liturgy that was derived by Knox and other ministers from some of Calvin's works. The church in which he preached, the Iglesia de Notre Dame de la Nueve, now known as the Auditoire de Calvin, has been grant, had been granted by the municipal authorities as Calvin's request for the English congregation. Knox's two sons, Nathaniel and Eliezer, were born in Geneva with Whittington and Miles Coverdale, their respective godfathers. In the summer of 1558, Knox published his best-known pamphlet. Now, this was quite a thing, this was. The, the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. <laughs> this was women being as sort of queens, in, like Queen Mary and also then the Queen Elizabeth. The, the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. In calling the regiment or rule of women monstrous, he meant that it was unnatural. Knox states that this purpose was to demonstrate how abominable before God is the empire or rule of a wicked woman. Yea, a, taste, a traitoress and bastard. What real strong language he used. The women rulers that Knox had in mind were Queen Mary I of England and Mary of Guise, the Dowager Queen of Scotland. And that's how he attacked them. So his life was really on the line. He, he did that. The, the, the impact of the document was complicated later because when Mary, Queen of England, at that stage died, it was her sister who came to the throne and she was another woman, which is Elizabeth I uh, of England, Elizabeth Tudor. And although Knox was not targeting Elizabeth, he had deeply offended her and she never forgave him. So he, never, he kept away from Elizabeth. With a Protestant on the throne, the English refugees in Geneva prepared to turn home. Knox himself decided to return to Scotland. Before his departure, various honours were confirmed on him, including the freedom of the city of Geneva. Knox left in January 1559, but he did not, not arrive in Scotland until May the 2nd, owing to Elizabeth's refusal to issue him a passport through England, in, as Elizabeth I, so he couldn't get through England up to Scotland. Well, revolution and the end of the Regency. There's a lot, quite a lot of it. But Reformation in Scotland. On August the 1st, the Scottish Parliament meant to settle a religious issue. Knox and five other ministers were called upon to draw up a new confession of faith. Within four days, the Scots Confession was presented to Parliament, voted upon and approved. A week later, the Parliament passed three acts in one day. The first abolished the jurisdiction of the Pope in Scotland, the second condemned all doctrine and practice contrary to the Reformed faith, and the third forbade the celebration of the Mass in Scotland. Before the dissolution of Parliament, Knox and the other ministers were given the task 
of organising the newly reformed church, or as it's called in Scotland, the Kirk. They would work for several months on the Book of Discipline, the document describing the organisation of the new church. During this period, in December 1580, Knox's wife Marjorie died, leaving Knox to care for their two sons, aged three and a half and two years. John Calvin, who had lost his own wife in 1549, wrote a letter of condolence. Well, Knox then was, had a problem because the new, the, new, the new ruler in Scotland was also a woman, Queen Mary, and so he was battling with her, very much so. A dramatic interview between Mary and Knox took place in uh, 24th of June, 1563. Mary summoned Knox to Holyrood Palace after hearing that he'd been preaching against her proposed marriage uh, uh, to, who was in fact to the son of Philip II of Spain. Mary began by scolding Knox. Then she burst into tears. What have you to do with my marriage, she asked, and what are ye within this commonwealth? A subject born within the same, ma madam, said Knox. He noted that though he was not of noble birth, he had the same duty as any subject to warn of dangers to the realm. When Mary started to cry again, he said, Madam, in God's presence I speak. I never delighted in the weeping of any of God's creatures. Yea, I can scarcely well abide the tears of my own boys, whom my own hand corrects. Much less can I rejoice in your majesty's weeping. He added that he would rather endure her tears, however, than remain silent and betray my commonwealth. At this, Mary ordered him out of the room. Well, that was his meetings with Mary, who was the queen, because she was going to marry a Spaniard, of course, and Spain, of course, is a Roman Catholic. His final years were in Edinburgh. On the 26th of March, 1564, Knox stirred controversy again when he married uh, 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 Margaret Stuart, the daughter of an old friend. Uh, Andrew Stewart, a member of the thing. The marriage was unusual because he was a widower of 50, of 50 while the bride was only 17. Very few details are known of their domestic life. They had three daughters, and then the Geneva Assembly convened in June 64. An argument broke out between Knox and Maitland over the authority of the civil government. The things like this had happened. When she, he criticised uh, the Queen Mary, the, the Scottish Queen, when she married a guy called Henry Lord Darnley uh, and, and, and others, and there, was, and there was a rebellion that actually broke out in Scotland while preaching in the presence of the new king consort. He made passing allusions on ungodly rulers which caused Darnley to walk out. Knox was summoned and prohibited from preaching while the court was at Edinburgh. Well, this is what the problems, prob these problems in fighting against it, the Scotland that had a civil war, what came into being, uh, and there was everything this was going on in Scotland because of the Queen trying to bring back in uh, Catholicism. It says this, and I'll cl conclude with this a little bit about, some bits a bit about here about Knox. In all of this, Knox claimed, none have I corrupted, none have I defrauded, merchandise have I not made. The paltry sum of money Knox bequeathed to his family, which would have left him in dire poverty, showed that he had not profited from any of his work in the, in the church. <coughs> the regent, Lord Morton, asked the General Assembly to continue paying his stipend to his widow for one year after his death, and the regent ensued, ensued that Knox's dependents were decently supported. Knox was survived by his five children and his second wife, Nathaniel and Eliezer, his two sons, by his first wife, attended St. John's College, Cambridge. Nathaniel became a fellow of St. John's, but died early in 1580. Eliezer was ordained into the Church of England and served in the parish of Clacton Magna. He also died young and was buried in the chapel of St. John's College in, 19, in 1591. Knox's second wife, Margaret Stewart, got, got remarried to Andrew Kerr, one of those involved in the murder of David Rizzio. Knox's three daughters also married, Martha to Alexander Fairley, Margaret to Zachary Point, son of Robert Pont, and brother of Timothy Pont, and Elizabeth to John Welsh, a minister of the church. Knox's death was barely noticed at the time. Although his funeral was attended by the nobles of Scotland, no major politician or diplomat mentioned his death in their letters that survive. Mary, Queen of Scots, made only two brief references to him in her letters, 
However, what the rulers feared were Knox's ideas more than Knox himself. He was a ruthless and successful revolutionary, and it was his revolutionary philosophy that had a great impact on the English Puritans. In fact, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that Knox was the father of English Puritanism, and, the, and he was the one who really brought about Puritanism in England. Despite his strictness and dogmatism, he has also been described by partisans as contributing to the struggle for genuine human freedom by teaching a duty to oppose unjust government in order to bring about moral and spiritual change. Knox was, no Knox was notable for the overthrow of Roman Catholicism in Scotland, but for, for, uh, so, uh, but for assuming the replacement of the established Christian religion with Presbyterianism rather than Anglicanism. So in Scotland, the Church of Scotland became, uh, became uh, 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 Presbyterian. And so the Presbyterian, this is one of the reasons I brought him in very much, because uh, the, Presbyter the Church of Scotland is Presbyterian in its nature. And then when <coughs> the English churches were discussing what they would do, uh, the Presbyterian churches from Scotland came down to England, and we find that the Presbyterianism affected West, what we call the Westminster Confession of Faith is really Presbyterian. And from the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Baptists adapted that unto our 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, not following the, completely on the doctrine of the church, but very much, much of the major doctrines of the Westminster Confession of Faith are found in our 1689. And it really goes back quite a lot to, to Knox and his influence and his effect on the Scottish church. Well, that's Knox. Can I just go? Sorry, I've got so many things here to look at. I'll look to do Calvin now. That's okay. We'll just do Calvin to far final. I've got a PowerPoint on Calvin. Can we have that? Okay. Right. We well, you know where we are concert comparing. Uh, yeah, it's in Switzerland. Okay. Calvin was actually French and born in France here. Okay. But Switzerland... And Switzerland wasn't a country like it is today. It was made out of cantons, <coughs> and there was no overall government over everything. It was just local governments of, of various towns. It would be like in the Philippines that, that Cebu was separate from Luzon, or, or probably from Visayas, you know, other parts of Visayas, from uh, different places like that. They were not one country, okay? It was all different cantons. Brief outline of his life. Born in July 10, 1509, in Noyon, Picardy, in northeastern France. Okay. His father worked for the Bishop of Noyon. So he had quite a lot of influence, and the Bishop uh, was very pleased with his father and helped him. And so they were very much Roman Catholic, being brought up in the Catholics. And due to his influence, Calvin was given two benefices which brought him money. In other words, Calvin, when he was a late teenager, and that, he actually was in charge of a couple of churches. He probably never visited them, but he got paid for, the, for this job. That was quite common. Two, he had two, two jobs, which he got paid for and never did. That's what happened to him, because he, of, the, of the influence of his father. He was sent to Paris to study, and in Paris he studied Latin and theology. Calvin then moved to Orléans, to study law. He then wanted to study law and he thought this was better and his father encouraged him uh, because many of the men, the law was the only other major thing, either the law or the church, which one we went to. So he was then to study law in Orléans, which is down in more in the south of France. So a brief outline of his life. In 1532, he published a commentary on Seneca's De Clementia. So this he would have written uh, uh, in Latin, okay, this commentary. And there's a copy of it. Uh, he was a typical, what we call, humanist. They were studying these uh, old Latin writers and others and Greek writers, and this is what they were doing. That's what they would study in universities. Uh, he then returned to Paris, and he had been so. And his while he was in Paris, that was when probably he was converted, about the latter part of 1532. There's a picture of when he was younger. 
possibly have been attending secret Protestant meetings in Paris. This is what he writes, and this was written, this is found in his uh, commentary on the Psalms, in the preface to that commentary, uh, you find this is where he records his conversion. God, by a sudden conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame, which has more hardened in such matters than might have been expected from one at my early period of life. Having thus received some taste and knowledge of true godliness, I was immediately inflamed with so in intense a desire to make progress therein that although I did not altogether leave off other studies, yet I pursued them with less ardour. From the preface to Calvin's commentary on the Psalms in 1555, uh, or three is it, I can't see. It's his conversion that he wrote about. However, he also described his conversion as somewhat more drawn out. The, uh, there are two, uh, these are two accounts. Probably the suddenness was when it happened, but he had many struggles until he was converted. The following, the following appears in his correspondence in 1539 with Cardinal Sadoletto. He was asked by the, the city of Geneva to answer the cardinal's call for the city to turn back to Rome. And so Calvin wrote a letter a long letter, long statement, very long, it's in his writings to Cardinal Sodoletto. His conversion then, being exceedingly alarmed at the misery into which I have fallen, and much more that which threatened me in a view of eternal death, I duty bound, I duly bound, duty bound myself, in, it made it my first business, business to betake myself to your way, condemning my past life, not without groans and tears. And now, O oh Lord, what remains to a wretch like me? But instead of defense, earnestly to supplicate you not to judge that fearful abandonment of your word according to its deserts, from which in your wondrous goodness you have at last delivered me. From his correspondence with Cardinal Soleto, Soleto. Nicholas Kopp, a friend of Calvin, was elected rector of the University of Paris, and Calvin helped prepare an inaugural address for November the 1st, 1533. This was an attack upon the church and a demand for reform along the lines of Luther. Kopp and Calvin were both forced to leave Paris as a result of anti-Protestant feeling that had basically run for their lives. So for the next three years, Calvin wandered, often under assumed names in France, Switzerland, and Italy. In 1536, he published his first edition of his Institutes of the Christian Religion. His first edition, by the way, okay? The first edition of the Institutes of 1536. Calvin arrived in Geneva in August 1536 where William Farrell threatened him with the curse of God if he preferred his studies to helping the cause of God in Geneva. You see, he, he, just passing through Geneva and then Farrell knew he was there and knew of this, of course, his institutes and wanted Calvin to stay and preach the gospel in Geneva and establish the church. And so threatened him like anything. Uh, it made Calvin really quake because he threatened him basically with damnation or something. You know, this is curse of God if he preferred his studies to helping the cause. So this was Farrell. William Farrell is, is English, but Guillaume Farrell, French name. Guillaume Farrell. Lifetime fr friend of Calvin. I studied French for five years at school, so okay. <laughs> Lifetime friend of Calvin, William Farrell. He was very fiery and sometimes erratic, but Calvin consulted him. Geneva, 1536 to 1538. Before the end of 1535, Geneva had become Protestant under the teaching of Farrell. This is a modern day photo of, taken from the big lake. The big tall church with the spire uh, is the church where Calvin would have preached. St. Pierre. Calvin, was, who was now employed as a teacher of scripture, 
confronted the city council with a program for reform in the first six months. <coughs> However, disagreements broke out between the reformers and the council. The reformers were expelled from the city in 1538. It's partly over who should be followed. Is it the word of God? Is it the order of scripture? And the, the council, of course, wanted to be a top dogs and everything and wanted what they wanted. And so the reformers were expelled from the city. So Calvin spent the years 1538 to 41 in Strasbourg, where he became a pastor of the French refugee congregation. This is where Martin Busser was. Strasbourg. This is Busser, Martin Busser. Calvin became the friend of the Lutheran reformer Martin Busser. Busser gave much help to Calvin and influenced him greatly, particularly concerning the doctrine of the church. During this period in Strasbourg, he also began a friendship with Philip Melanchthon, the Lutheran theologian who was to be the successor of Martin Luther. Martin Luther died in 1548. Sorry, 1546, sorry. Strasbourg, 1538-41. In September 1540, he got married to Idelette de Bourg, a widow. And there we are. She already had three children. So Calvin ended up with a family, a wife, and three children straight away. <laughs> she bore him a son, sadly, who died in infancy. His wife only lived for nine years. I mean, death was very common in those days. I mentioned the plague which ravaged Europe again and again. And you find many of the pastors, wives and family members dying of the plague. Um, I read quite a few books on this period and it was so common for death. You never knew when it was coming. There was, we didn't have any medicines and things like that. In fact, one of the common medicines was to let blood. You just cut the person's arm and let them bleed for a while as if that's going to help you. He remarried a widower, or sorry, he remained a widower for the rest of his life. He never got married again, Geneva again. A change in government meant that he was asked to return to Geneva, which he did do so, where he remained until his death in 1564. Calvin then set about reforming this immoral city. He had a lot of struggles with the city government because he believed that the church should be the ones to exercise discipline. Not all the Genevans were supporters of Calvin and at times there was strong opposition. Again, this is the church where Calvin preached in, in Geneva. Calvin dominated the city by moral suasion rather than by any other means. His influence was exceedingly great, not only in the city, but beyond. Pierre Viret. Viret was for a time in Geneva, but was associated with the city of Lausanne, where he was the leading reformer. That's a city fairly close to, uh, to Geneva, not very far, probably about an hour drive in a car. He was French and a close friend and colleague of Calvin. He eventually, went, he eventually uh, after Lausanne, he did return to Geneva and work with Calvin in Geneva. Geneva again. Calvin was largely responsible for establishing a universal system of education for the young. He took a large part in arranging for the care of the poor and the aged. Above all, he sought to make Geneva a Christian commonwealth in practice as well as doctrine. Now this guy, Michael Servetus, a Spaniard who denied the Trinity, came to Geneva. And this is always declared as a blot upon Calvin because this man denied the Trinity. Uh, he was a heretic and everybody was opposed to him wherever he went. Uh, and he came to Geneva. He was arrested and he was recognized and sentenced to death and then burnt at the stake. Now, that was a common thing for such heretics. And everybody in basically Europe agreed with the sentencing, but he's, Calvin, we are told, in some ways wanted death by hanging or something, but not call. This was done with the approval of the other Swiss Protestant cities as well as the Roman Catholics. Uh, 
But it's always declared as a blot upon Calvin that he burnt somebody. But as I say, it was common. There was some evidence that Calvin wanted to change the form of execution to hanging. This execution is always looked upon as a blot upon the life of Calvin. He was, however, also a man of his time. Everybody else agreed with this, this man should have been put to death in such a way. Calvin's writings. He constantly maintained a voluminous correspondence with people all over Europe. This is his handwriting and signature. I think this is a photo I took. There's a museum just the back of where the church is in Geneva, which is all dedicated to Calvin, and I took photographs inside there when I was there. Commentaries. He wrote commentaries on 23 books of the Old Testament, all the New Testament, except Revelation. He said about Revelation he couldn't understand it, so don't worry if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Calvin's writings. Commentary on Joshua, 1565. Calvin's writings. Institutes of Christian Religion. The final edition, it came and went through lots of editions, in 1559 contained four books with a total of 79 chapters. It was produced not only in Latin, but also in French. The Banner of Truth have recently translated the French edition into English. It's much more simple to read. That's why they've done it. Calvin's writings. This is probably the greatest writing of the Reformation, his institutes. Calvin's preaching. This, not only did he write much, he also preached every day on alternate weeks. Uh, he preached morning and evening in, in, on Sunday, then he preached every day in, for one week. And preached again on a Sunday, but then the next week he would take off. The, the days of the weeks he wouldn't preach. And then he would go back Sunday again, preach, and then every day. So every alternate week he would preach a sermon every day. That's his pulpit in the Church of St. Pierre. Uh, this is quite common, you see, because look, this is the type of pulpit you'll find in the churches in those days. You go up the stairs. This thing up here is always there. Why is it there? It's a sounding board. It helps project the sound forward. Otherwise, your voice goes straight up into the rafters. So it goes up there and would bounce back down towards the people. It's a sounding board. And you find in all the old churches, they have these pulpits like this with the sounding board above them. Many of his sermons were taken down and later published, copied by somebody sitting in the, in, in the, in the audience, in the congregation, and copied the... But, you know, doing... All the same, at the same time, he produced tracts on many subjects. A very hard-working man, he really was. Although John Calvin is most generally renowned as a theologian, biblical commentator, and ecclesiastical statement, there can be little doubt that his work as a preacher took as much or even more of his time and was at least as influential as these other activities. Douglas Kelly. Calvin's preaching. Calvin preached some 4,000 sermons in his lifetime. Scribes wrote down his sermons. Sadly, this is sadly, in 1805, the Library of Geneva sold most of his sermons as scrap paper. <laughs> Stupid, isn't it? Some students found some of the manuscripts and returned them later. Today we possess nearly 1,500 of them. But a lot of them are lost, several thousand. Calvin the Preacher. From 1549, Calvin usually preached every day of, of, of alternative weeks and twice on a Sunday. His custom was to expound the Old Testament in the weekdays and the New Testament on Sundays although sometimes he gave up Sunday afternoon to the Psalms. It's his chair where he used to sit in the church. Oh, sorry about that, it's moved on. I was trying to get it to move, it wasn't moving. Okay, his chair. 
Geneva with the Church of Calvin, again, the, the St. Pierre, that large spire. Quite a number of other churches in the city as well where different men would preach. Other men which he has been training and then all the villages around about Geneva which were responsible for Geneva, the church, Calvin again and the men with him would supply preachers in those churches. The old city of Geneva today. That's the church of Calvin. John Knox had a church, has a small, was preaching in a small church just at the back of St. Pierre. There's a little church back there. And John Knox, was, was, when he was in Geneva, preached in that church. That's my last slide. No, it's not. Calvin here. John Knox, you see, 1514 to 1572. Pastor of the English congregation in Geneva, 1556 to 1559. Statue of Calvin in the Museum of the Reformation. Calvin's health. He was always Ill, in ill health, driving himself very hard. He died at the age of 54 on May the 27th, 1564, and according to Calvin's instructions, was buried in an unmarked grave because he, he was fearful that they would dig him up and then do something to his body, you know, burn it or something. This is a, a, a painting which is supposed to be of his, his, of his deathbed and the men uh, around it, etc. Theodore Beza, 1519 to 1605, was the one who took over. And this is the, the wall the, which has been built in, in Geneva. It's known as the Reformation Wall. Calvin is in the one ford at the middle there. This is Calvin. That's Farrell. This is Beza, and this will be Knox. Another picture. There we are. <laughs> Just to prove I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> My name wasn't up there, though. <laughs> biographies of Calvin, okay? It's Just a few biographies you can look at. Okay, Robert Godfrey. There are lots more as well. I, th those are the ones I've read, okay? Books on Calvin's theology, different ones down there, okay. Right. <clears throat>